Okay. Uh, we're talking about the uh, origin and fate of the universe. And uh, let me remind you of the story so far. Uh, Um, and there are basically two sets of observations that are important here. One is uh, the existence of the Hubble diagram uh, and Hubble's law, which is the observational relationship between distance and velocity for galaxies. Uh, and this leads you to the idea of a universal expansion. And the other is what we discussed last time, uh, that um, if you look back into the past, if you observe uh, with uh, a large, at a large distance, that is to say a large look back time, uh, what you discover is uh, that things were different in the past. that the universe as a whole uh, looked somewhat, uh, somewhat different, and in particular uh, was uh, significantly denser, which is exactly what you would predict if uh, the universe was expanding. And these two things, these two observational facts put together are really uh, what lead to uh, the idea of a universe with a Big Bang cosmology. And this is great uh, because you can then uh, use this assumption that everything is governed by this scale factor of the universe. And the scale factor starts uh, either at zero or very close to zero and gets bigger with time. And you can use that concept to uh, do all sorts of wonderful things. You can describe the past. Uh, and in particular, uh, one of the things we did last time was to calculate the age of the universe from, from the observations of the Hubble constant. And you can predict the future. And the future depends on uh, how the expansion of the scale factor changes. If the scale factor just continues to expand at its current rate, the universe will continue to expand. Uh, and gradually get sparser and sparser and colder and colder and more and more boring. Uh, but it's not expected that the scale, that the expansion rate stays the same. It's expected that the expansion rate will change. And in particular, it's expected that the expansion rate will slow down. Why? Because there's matter in the universe. And matter uh, exerts gravity. And gravity tends to pull things back together again. And so this is where we ended up uh, last time. Uh, if you assume that gravity is the dominant force. That is to say that any changes in the expansion rate of the universe will be due to gravity. Uh, then you can derive this critical density, which we did last time, which is a, a quantity equal to 3h squared over 8 pi g. H you measure, the other things are just constants, and you can calculate uh, what this quantity is. Now, at this point, let me uh, write down a piece of astronomical jargon, uh, which I didn't do last time. Uh, it, the, dense, the actual density of the universe divided by this critical density uh, is given a letter of its own. This is, give, this is written down as a capital omega. So omega is uh, the true, uh, the actual density of the universe, whatever that turns out to be, divided by the critical density. And then you can describe the future of the universe depending on what omega is. If omega is greater than 1, that means that the density is greater than the critical density. Uh, and this leads to recollapse and the big crunch. Whereas if omega is less than 1, uh, the universe expands forever. Somebody asked, what happens if omega is exactly equal to 1? 
Uh, in that case, there's no big crunch. Uh, the universe expands forever, but the expansion rate asymptotically approaches zero. Uh, but of course, in real life, it's very hard to get something uh, that's exactly some any physical quantity to be <coughs> precisely equal to any theoretical value. Um, and so, with this in mind, uh, it then becomes very important to actually go out and measure the average density of the universe, uh, because uh, then you could divide it by this critical. Uh, density. We've already measured H, so we know what this quantity is, and then you could figure out what's going to happen. So uh, the goal here is to determine uh, the density of the universe. And conceptually, this isn't such a hard thing to do. You go out and measure the mass of everything you can see. Uh, you try and uh, do it over a large volume. Because what you want to avoid, the mistake you want to avoid, is to uh, measure uh, the density of a piece of the universe that doesn't represent the overall average. If we measured the density of uh, material in this room, uh, it would be uh, something like 27 orders of magnitude bigger than the critical density. And if we assumed that the universe were just like this room, obviously it would recollapse. In fact, it would have recollapsed long ago. Uh, but uh, we don't do that because, of course, most of the universe is not like this room. Most of the universe is empty. So you say, well, we better include a lot of stars uh, and the empty spaces between them. But uh, even that's a mistake because you're measuring stars in our own galaxy. So you say, well, we better include lots of galaxies and the empty space spaces between them. Uh, that still doesn't work for a while because there are clusters of galaxies. There are clusters of clusters of galaxies. And so uh, you have to go really quite far out before you have a fair sample uh, of what the average conditions in the universe are like. But in principle, that's certainly po possible to do. You just keep measuring things further and further and further away until you get to a point where if you increase the distance, where as you increase the distance, that density doesn't change anymore. So you're out to the part uh, where you've really uh, achieved the average. How do you know you've achieved the average? Well, you look out twice as far and you get the same answer. Uh, and so, uh, in principle, the way you do this is you add up all the mass uh, in some uh, uh, sizable chunk of the universe in a sufficiently large chunk of the universe, where sufficiently large is sufficiently large to average over uh, 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 any local uh, perturbations. Uh, so you add up all the mass, and you divide by the volume. You divide by the volume that that uh, uh, mass occupies. And so obviously, you have to identify all the different kinds of mass. Uh, and uh, you have to make sure that whatever volume you've taken, you've found all the mass in it. You add it all up. You divide by volume. Uh, you determine uh, that gives you a value for density. You divide by the critical density, and you know what's going to happen uh, to the universe. OK. Uh, now, how do you find the mass of things? Determining mass. Well. One way you can do it is you can just go out and uh, measure how bright. Yes, go ahead. Oh, put this back for a second. Top part, bottom part, what do you? Yeah. Yeah, so you determine the density of the universe by adding up the mass uh, divided by the volume. Uh, and then the question becomes how do you determine the mass? Uh, and uh, one way you can do it is you, uh, uh, you look at how bright things are. Add up the light you see. And then you assume uh, some value for the amount of mass it takes to uh, create a certain amount of lice, light. So that's assuming what's called a mass to light ratio. Uh, and so you can do that, you know, if it's the sun, then one solar mass 
produces one solar luminosity. If all stars, if all objects are exactly like the sun, then everything would be like that. It turns out that isn't the case, uh, but you can take local samples of stars and figure out what the average mass to light ratio is. Uh, and if you have some value that you're happy with of mass to light ratio, then uh, you multiply the amount of light by the mass to light ratio, and this gives you a mass. Uh, sorry? Uh, well, what you mean by light is uh, the, do you need to adjust for distance? Uh, what you mean by light is the intrinsic light. You mean the equivalent of the absolute magnitude, which takes the distance into account. So what you need to, to ask is not how bright it looks, uh, but uh, its intrinsic brightness in this particular case. Yes, so you do, you do need to account for the distance, and so you need to be thinking about absolute magnitude rather than apparent magnitude. Yes, uh, but, and, and that's one of the problems. That's hard to do. The other problem, of course, is this awkward word here, uh, which is the kind of thing that makes people nervous, uh, because you could get that wrong. Uh, if you're looking at uh, one kind of star and it's actually some other kind of star, which, which happens to be much more massive but dimmer, uh, like uh, white dwarfs or something like that, uh, then you're going to make a mess of this. So there's an alternative method, uh, which you uh, may already have considered because we've done it in both of the previous parts of this class, which is uh, you measure orbits. And you do the same thing we did with in part one and part two of the class. Uh, you find some star in the distant portion of a galaxy orbiting around the galaxy. You figure out how fast the thing is going. You figure out how far the thing is going. You use Kepler's laws. Uh, and you uh, determine uh, the mass from orbital theory, from Kepler's laws, basically. And in particular, you know, v squared is equal to gm over a. And so you can measure this from the Doppler shift. Uh, you can determine this. Uh, basically, in the case of galaxies, galaxies are big objects. You can physically measure uh, uh, the uh, angular separation on the sky and use the small angle formula if you know the distance to determine this. So this can also be measured, uh, and therefore this can be calculated. And so you go and do that for a whole bunch of galaxies. Uh, and this has been done. And uh, let, me, let me give you some examples here. Let me uh, actually write down some numbers and do, and do some calculations. Supposing you have a galaxy uh, at a distance of 20 megaparsecs. Uh, and supposing it has an apparent magnitude of something like 14. Uh, these are kind of typical numbers for uh, galaxies in uh, nearby galaxy clusters. In there's a particular, the nearest big galaxy cluster to, to us is a cluster in the constellation of Virgo, known as the Virgo Cluster. If you want to know about the Virgo Cluster, ask Hugh Kral, who is devoting his life to the study of this object uh, and the galaxies within it. But these are sort of quasi-typical numbers, uh, uh, adjusted slightly because it's actually <laughs> 17 megaparsecs, which is kind of a pain. Uh, all right, so uh, what do you know about the mass? What can you determine about the mass of such, an, such a galaxy? Well, oh, and let me warn you before we even begin that, of course, astronomers have played you a dirty trick, namely that the uh, symbol we use for magnitude is m. Uh, the symbol we use for mass is also m. Uh, so you've got to keep those clear in your mind. Uh, all right, so what do we know about this? We know uh, the relationship between apparent and absolute magnitude. And as I, I said just a minute ago, it's the absolute magnitude that we need to know in order to uh, uh, actually determine anything. m minus m is equal to 5 log d over 10 parsecs. So uh, let's figure out the right-hand side first. That's 5 log uh, 2 times 10 to the 7, that's 20 megaparsecs. 1 megaparsec is 10 to the 6. Uh, over 10, uh, that's 5 log uh, 
uh, 2 times 10 to the 6. Now, what do I do about that? Let's see. That's uh, 5 times log of 10 to the 6. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, plus uh, the log of 2. Because uh, uh, if you add logs, then you multiply the thing inside the parentheses. So log of 2 plus log of 10 to the 6 is equal to log of 2 times 10 to the 6. Log of 10 to the 6 is 6. Log of 2 is 0.3. It's just a useful number to know. Uh, the log of 2 is around 0.3. The log of 3 is around 0.5. The log of 5 is around 0.7. Uh, you could look it up. Uh, and so this is equal to 5 times 6.3. 5 times 6 is 30. 5 times 0.3 is 1 and a half. So this is 31.5. Uh, let me caution you at this point. Uh, so let me give you a little side note here. Uh, do not approximate magnitudes. Why not? I mean, we approximate everything else in this course. Magnitudes are a logarithmic quantity, right? Uh, and so you don't approximate magnitudes for the same reason uh, that you don't uh, uh, that you don't approximate the exponents. You can't say 10 to the 7 is equal to 10 to the 6. You can say 7 equals 6, but you can't say 10 to the 7 is equal to 10 to the 6 because uh, that's a factor of 10 difference, whereas the difference between 7 and 6 is, is just a little more than 10 percent. Similarly, this 0.3. Uh, you would have been tempted to get rid of it, right? Because uh, who cares about, a, uh, about the difference between 6 and 6.3? But in fact, it comes out of this log of 2. And so 0.3 in the log is actually a factor of 2. Uh, and so you've got you to gotta not approximate the exponents. This is important. Yes? Does this mean we should also try to be more precise? Well, yes, that's saying, uh, I guess that's saying the same thing. Should you be more precise. That means you shouldn't approximate. Yeah, so I guess. Uh, 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 but um, uh, but it's, it's, it's for the same reason that you don't approximate the exponents. Uh, and it's also true that uh, the numbers are easier to work with because it turns out that you add them rather than multiplying them most of the time. So it's not such a bad thing. Anyway, here we are at 31.5. Uh, so what do we got? We've got uh, m minus m is equal to 31.5. This m was stated in the problem to be 14. Uh, so 14 minus 31.5 equals m. Uh, so m is equal to minus 17 and a half. Okay. Uh, that's not such a bad number. We can work with that. Uh, now, what do we, so now we know the absolute magnitude. We know how bright the thing is. So now we can figure out how many times brighter than the sun it is. Why is that a useful thing? Because if you then make the assumption that the mass to light ratio is the same as the sun, that this galaxy consists entirely of sun-like stars, uh, then you can determine <laughs> how massive it is. So let's do that. Uh, how many suns? Uh, and this is the other magnitude equation. This is, uh, you know, m1 minus m2 is equal to, uh, for two different objects, is equal to minus 5 halves log of the brightness of one over the brightness of the other. Uh, and now, but I think I want it in the other form. I think I want it in the form 10 to the minus 0.4 or 10 to the minus 2 fifths uh, m1 minus m2 is equal to uh, b1 over b2. This is the exact same equation, as you'll recall, uh, uh, just uh, uh, having been getting rid of the log, taking, every, taking everything, putting it on, uh, to the 10 to the something power. Uh, the reason I want it in this form is that this is the answer I want. I want b1 over b2. I want 1 to be the galaxy. I want 2 to be the sun. So then I've got 10 to the minus 2 fifths, and then the galaxy is minus 17 and a half. That's the absolute magnitude. Uh, the sun is minus 
uh, the sun is five, has an absolute magnitude of five, and that's going to give me the brightness of the galaxy over the brightness of the sun. Uh, that's 10 to the minus two fifths of 22 and a half. Uh, let's see, the minuses cancel out, so that's a plus actually. Two fifths times 22 and a half. Well, let's see, two times 22 and a half is 45. A fifth of 45 is 9. So this is equal to 10 to the 9. So this galaxy is a billion times brighter than the sun, 10 to the 9 times brighter than the sun. So uh, if it were made out of sun-like stars, it would have a mass of a billion solar masses. So mass uh, would equal 10 to the 9 times the mass of the sun if all sun-like stars. But it turns out that galaxies tend to be somewhat dimmer than the sun per unit mass. Uh, most stars are uh, a little bit less massive than the sun, but a lot less bright. Uh, this is just the way stars turn out to be. Uh, and so typical mass to light ratios of, of populations of stars tend to be on the order of 10 or something like that times the sun. So uh, probably it needs to be more massive because typical stars are fainter than the sun. Typically stars are fainter. Uh, so you could guess and say mass maybe should be, I don't know, 10 times greater than that, 10 to the 10 solar masses. And you can see why this uh, particular line of reasoning uh, starts to get pretty dubious because that I, I, I picked this number completely out of the air. Uh, there's actually some modest basis for it, but you could pick other numbers. Uh, you could argue about this endlessly, uh, and you wouldn't get very far. Why should it be 10 times the sun? Maybe it's 100, maybe it's 1,000, maybe it's less than the sun. Uh, how would you really know? Uh, and so let's go back and do the other approach, namely uh, figure out uh, its mass from orbits of things around it. So let's look at, uh, supposing it's an edge-on galaxy, here's the center of the galaxy. Uh, or, and uh, actually, let's look at it from the top. So here's a nice spiral galaxy of some kind. Here's the center of the spiral galaxy. Here's some star way out on the edge. Uh, that star is moving around the center of the galaxy. It has to be, or it's going to fall in. So it's orbiting around the center of the galaxy, presumably in some circular orbit. You're down here looking at this thing, and of course you can measure the velocity of that star by the Doppler shift because it's moving away from you. Uh, and so one can measure this velocity. Uh, you can measure this distance. Uh, that would be uh, the equivalent of A in our formulas because it's the distance between the orbiting object and the center. Uh, stars are much less massive than galaxies, so we don't have to worry about the motion of the galaxy. And you can use a familiar equation, namely uh, V squared equals GM over A. So now let's give this some numbers. Uh, typical velocities of things orbiting around uh, the galaxy turn out to be something like 200 kilometers a second or 2 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. Uh, and uh, the size of a typical galaxy, you know, out to where it stops being easy to see stars is, uh, oh, I don't know, what number did I take here? Uh, yeah, let's call it 20 kiloparsecs, which is 2 times 10 to the 4. Uh, parsecs, and a parsec is 3 times 10 to the 16 meters. So this is 6 times 10 to the 20 meters. So now let's calculate m. m equals v squared a over g, uh, 2 times 10 to the 5 squared, uh, 6 times 10 to the 20th, uh, over 7 times 10 to the minus 11. Get rid of those. Uh, let's see, that's 4 times 10 to the 30 over 10 to the minus 11, 4 times 10 to the 41. This is in kilograms. One solar mass, you recall, is 2 times 10 to the 30. So this mass 
in, in units of the sun, 4 times 10 to the 41 over 2 times 10 to the 30, which is something like 2 times 10 to the 11 solar masses. And now we have a problem, right? You, re you, you probably don't remember what the answer to the previous version of this problem was, where we did it with light. That came out to uh, a magnitude of, uh, uh, the brightness was about 10 to the 9 times the sun. Maybe the mass is 10 to the 10 times the sun. But now we've just calculated it in this other, more reliable way. And it's 2 times 10 to the 11. It's 20 times more massive than you thought it was going to be, given how bright, uh, uh, how bright the light from this thing was. Yes, question? This is the mass of the galaxy, yes. Um, now, before I go on, let me just point out, those of you who have taken a look at the problem set, what I've just done here, this calculation I've just done, is problem one of the problem set, except done backwards. Uh, in, on the problem set, what I did is I told you what the, ma what the density was, what the critical density was. And then uh, uh, you had to derive characteristics of the galaxies from that. Here I've told you what the galaxies are like. Uh, we figured out uh, how big, uh, how massive they are. Uh, if we divide by the volume, uh, we'll get a density. So we're doing the same problem backwards. I should say the numbers I've chosen here are different. Uh, so you can't know the answer to the problem set by looking at the premises of, th of these particular things. But the, uh, uh, what I'm doing is the exact same set of calculations, only done, uh, done backwards. Uh, so uh, that may or may not be helpful. Uh, but let's pause here for a moment. Because this is now, uh, we're now up to, we're making progress. Uh, we're now up to frontiers and controversies circa 1985. You'll remember in 1920, they were worried about whether the spiral nebulae were actually galaxies. In 1950, they were worried about maybe the steady state was the correct uh, response. And by the time 1985 rolls around, the big issue is uh, uh, masses determined by orbital rotation. Uh, so what you might call dynamical masses. That is to say determined by uh, orbits of things around galaxies, orbits around galaxies, and also, I should say, galaxy clusters. Uh, you can have galaxies orbiting around each other and, and galaxies uh, orbiting around whole clusters of galaxies. And the same thing is true and ga uh, so around galaxies and galaxy clusters. Uh, are much bigger than you expect from the light they give off. And therefore, uh, by about a factor of 10, by approximately a factor of 10. So there's 10 times more mass than you can account for by adding up all the stars. Now, there's mass in other forms than stars. There's also, uh, um, uh, there's also dust. There's also gas. These are things you can detect in other ways. You add them all up, uh, and uh, you're still off by about a factor of 10. So there's 10 times more mass than you have uh, any way uh, of accounting for. This is the so-called dark matter problem. So this is Frontiers and Controversies in 1985. Uh, there's all this dark matter. Most of the matter in galaxies is in some form that we can't detect. It's dark matter. And what is it? Now, unlike Frontiers and Controversies in 1920 and 1950, this is one that we haven't solved yet. So I don't know the answer. Uh, for a quarter of a century, people have been busily trying to figure this out. Uh, there's still no good answer. And 10 years ago, when I taught this course, uh, what this question of what is the dark matter was a big focus of this part of the course. Uh, now I'm going to uh, uh, 
uh, talk about it only in, in this class, only in one lecture, uh, because we got way bigger problems either than this. Uh, that's saying a lot. Uh, I've just told you that we don't know what 90% of the mass in the universe is, and then we've got bigger problems than that. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, things are getting a little murky here, uh, and not just because the matter is dark. Um, okay, so what, uh, so, but let me pause a little bit on dark matter because it's an interesting problem. Uh, and what, uh, as I say, we have no idea what this stuff is. What are the possibilities? So here's a hypothesis. Uh, hypothesis number one is that what this stuff is is uh, some kind of unknown uh, subatomic particle. Uh, and it has to have two characteristics, this subatomic particle, for it to work out. It has to have mass. Uh, that's pretty basic. If you're using it to explain mass, you can't have photons, right? Photons don't carry any mass. Uh, it has to have mass, but it has to uh, not interact with light. No interaction with light. If it absorbs light, it would be opaque. And we would know it was there because galaxies behind this stuff would look dim. Uh, alternatively, if it gives off light, uh, then we'd see it. Uh, and so uh, it, it has to not interact with light or interact with light only very weakly. Uh, and so these are given the name, uh, generically, weakly interactive, interactive, massive particles, or WIMPs. So here's the hypothesis. The universe is 90% WIMPs. Uh, this is not such a crazy idea as it, it might at first seem. There are known subatomic particles that have these properties. There's something called the neutrino. There are trillions of them going through this room every second. Uh, they have mass. Uh, and they don't interact very much with anything. Uh, they're known to exist from particle, uh, uh, particle accelerator experiments, and they have been detected from celestial sources. Now, we know that the, for various reasons that the dark matter doesn't consist of neutrinos, uh, uh, but there could be many other kinds of particles uh, with these kinds of characteristics, and indeed some are predicted uh, by current particle theories. Uh, as I say, WIMPs have been uh, detected, the, uh, the, the, sorry, WIMPs have not been detected, but neutrinos have been detected. Here's how they do it. It's kind of an amazing experiment. Uh, they took a mine shaft in, in South Dakota and filled it with cleaning fluid. And the reason they did that was that every so often, uh, neutrinos don't interact with, uh, with light, but they do interact occasionally with chlorine atoms. And the effect of a neutrino banging into a chlorine atom is to turn it into argon. Uh, and so this happens. Uh, there, are, as I say, trillions of neutrinos flow through this mine every second. Once a day or so, one of them will hit a chlorine atom just right, create an argon atom. So here's what you do. You fill your mine shaft with cleaning fluid, a large fraction of which is chlorine. Uh, and you count the argon atoms that bubble off the top. Uh, and this has been successful. Uh, they detected neutrinos emitted from the sun. The sun is all stars that, that have uh, 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 nuclear reactions going on in them emit neutrinos as part of the output of these nuclear reactions. Uh, and then they had a problem because they had predicted how many uh, neutrinos you ought to see from the sun in an experiment of this kind, and they didn't see enough of them. They only saw a third of them. And it turns out, and then there was a big debate for a long time. This is, this is frontiers and controversies circa about 1975. Uh, there was a big debate for a while. Where are all the solar neutrinos? Is it possible that we don't understand nuclear reactions in the sun? Is it possible that we don't understand the chemistry of, our, of uh, chlorine and argon? After all, you're counting individual argon atoms. So that's a kind of a difficult task. Uh, no, it turned out that what was going on was we didn't understand neutrinos. And it turns out there are three kinds of neutrinos. And neutrinos 
uh, switch back and forth between these different kinds. And you could only detect one kind by the chlorine. And so you only detect, and, and so they were all emitted from the sun as if they were the kind you could, uh, in the form that you would have been able to detect them. But as they traveled from the sun to us, uh, some fraction of them uh, flipped back and forth between all these other, other kinds. And you ended up only with about a third of them. So it was a big piece of particle physics that was discovered. Uh, we have also detected by now uh, neutrinos coming from supernova explosions. So uh, there are 20, uh, uh, 11 of them, I think, were detected all at once. And if you're detecting things sort of once per day, and then you suddenly detect 11 of them over the course of a few minutes, uh, you've seen something exciting occur. And that was, uh, uh, no, is now known to be this, this supernova explosion that occurred in a neighboring galaxy. Uh, and uh, so there are a bunch of, so by analogy with that, people are looking for the WIMPs that make up the dark matter. If it turns, if all this dark matter is in WIMPs, there are lots and lots and lots of these things, and they're going through us every second. So there are a whole bunch of experiments with the same basic characteristics. You have a huge vat of something, and something is supposed to happen occasionally when one of these wimps hits whatever's in the vat. Uh, so the Japanese have uh, uh, sort of a cubic mile of distilled water. And they're looking for little light flashes when the uh, neutrino runs into the water molecule. They, they, they busted all their detectors recently. They had a sort of earthquake, and it was bad for the little light detectors they had put on the inside of these things. Uh, but there are a lot of such uh, experiments. Dan McKinsey here in the physics department is a, is, is a big player in one of them. Uh, and the hope is that you will see the interaction between one of these WIMPs, of which there must be an incredibly large number, uh, with something. This has so far failed. Uh, so there is no direct evidence from WIMPs. Uh, the other hope, I should say, is that every time you build a bigger collider, you make new kinds of subatomic particles, and that they'll eventually make something that looks like it could be a WIMP. And that hasn't uh, been happened either. Uh, so uh, no detections yet. No direct uh, detections. Uh, with considerable effort, you know, this is going to turn out to be 90% of the mass in the universe, so you would like to detect it, because if you do, they'll give you a Nobel Prize. Uh, all right, that's one hypothesis. There's another hypothesis. And so here's hypothesis number two. It's just, you know, dark chunks of something that doesn't glow. Ordinary matter, uh, chunks. Yes, yes, yes. All of it, we don't know what it is. And so nothing has yet been ruled out. What happens is that they, you know, they continue to conduct these experiments so you can rule out WIMPs with certain kinds of characteristics because you would have detected them. Similarly, you can rule out some of these other things with certain characteristics because you would have noticed they were there. Uh, but both of these hypotheses are still more or less viable. Uh, chunks of ordinary matter uh, that just don't glow, that don't emit light. Now, there's some limitations. Can, they, these chunks can't be too small. Because if what you've got are, are tiny, you know, micron-sized particles, uh, we call that dust. Uh, and it, basically, that's what it is. It, it would just be dust. Uh, the problem with dust is dust uh, in large quantities is opaque. And you can't see through it. And therefore, you would know it was there. Uh, because it obscures the light of things behind it. And indeed, we see cosmic dust this way all the time. It's just there isn't nearly enough of it to account for any substantial fraction of the dark matter. So uh, dust uh, would uh, be observed because it, uh, by obscuring light. And it also tends to glow in the infrared. Uh, and so we know that dust exists, but we can, we can count how much of it there is because it obscures light and it uh, makes its presence known in other ways. It's also true that these chunks of ordinary matter can't be too big. They can't be the size of whole galaxies or even a substantial fraction of a galaxy. You can't take all your dark matter and put it into one lump per galaxy or even 100 lumps per galaxy because if they were very large masses, uh, you'd see it because it would, uh, it would 
disrupt uh, the orbits of stars around the galaxy. So if there was some huge unknown uh, mass, you'd see things orbiting around it. And in fact, we do. Uh, we see these supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. And we know they're there because we see stars orbiting around them, uh, just like uh, the problem on, on, on the last <laughs> midterm. Uh, and so it can't be too small. It can't be too big. Uh, but you could perhaps have sort of a bunch of star massed. So you could have sort of a bunch of star massed uh, or planet massed dark things in, uh, it would have to be for various technical reasons that I won't go into, it has to be in the outer parts of galaxies, in the halos of galaxies. So that in principle is possible. We wouldn't have any direct way of detecting them. These things are called uh, massive astrophysical uh, compact halo object. Yeah, some people get it. Uh, massive because they have to carry mass. Astrophysical because they're not particles. Compact because if they were big, you'd, you know, they'd block light and you'd see them. Halo because that's the part of the galaxy they're in. Uh, these are machos, right? And so the alternative to wimps is machos. Uh, and so uh, the alternative explanation is that 90% of the universe is machos. Uh, there have, there's been a very clever experiment carried out to try and find these things. Uh, here's how you do it. You do it with gravitational lensing. Lensing macho searches. Remember gravitational lensing? This is this business that mass bends light. Uh, so here you are. You're looking at some star. And in between you and the star is a macho of some kind. So here's the macho. You can't see the macho. But the presence of the macho uh, changes the direction of the light. So it comes into you like this. And it basically acts like a lens. And in particular, the way it acts like a lens in the case of Macho's lensing stars uh, is it makes it brighter. Makes the star brighter. Uh, now, in order for this to work, the alignment has to be essentially perfect. Uh, all of these objects are moving around. You know, they're orbiting the galaxy and stuff. So the alignment uh, holds for a few weeks, typically. So what you'll see is you'll see this star become much brighter. And it can really become much brighter. We're talking tens to hundreds of times brighter than it ordinarily was. This lasts for a few weeks, and then it goes away. These have been observed. These lensing events have been observed. Lensing events observed. Uh, but there are too few of them. Uh, to explain the dark matter. Now, there are still ways out. Let's see. If you have particularly low mass machos, so things, the mass, supposing the whole universe is, is filled with things about the mass of Earth, uh, those won't cause, uh, those, those cause uh, lensing events that might be too small to see. Alternatively, supposing you have things that are many thousands of times the mass of a star, uh, but not big enough to totally disrupt uh, galactic orbits, uh, then there are much many fewer of them for a given amount of mass, and, and there aren't enough macho events that you would have expected to see any substantial number of them. So there's still a way around the result of these experiments if you want to believe in machos, uh, but it's getting very tough. Uh, so. Uh, so no machos, no wimps detected so far. No machos. Uh, you could still postulate kinds of wimps and kinds of machos that might explain the dark matter. Uh, but it's getting kind of tough. Most people, I think, uh, believe in, in, in wimps. Most uh, people tend to believe in this. Uh, but and as far as I can tell, 
Uh, that's because the particle physicists keep coming up with new candidate WIMPs that might exist, but that we haven't quite been able to see so far. Uh, uh, and so there's uh, a theoretical basis for the existence of these things. Whereas with these machos, if you ask the astronomers, well, fine. So you want to have 90% of the universe be in little Earth-like things just floating around with no star. How did, they, how, how did that happen? How did these come into being? Uh, we really have no answer at all for that. So there's no theoretical basis for any of the, of the still allowed categories of machos. Uh, and so uh, at the moment, people tend to believe wimps over machos, although there's no direct evidence for either. Yes? Yeah, also like if 90% um, if of the matter in the universe was made of little Earth-like objects, then uh, wouldn't that mean 90% of the universe was made of metal? Oh, uh, Earth, Earth, so Earth mass objects is what I meant. I don't care what it's made out of. Uh, yeah, maybe they're, maybe they're little Earth-sized Earth balls of hydrogen. Uh, that would be fine, too, uh, except how do you get them? Uh, we know something about how balls of, 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 of hydrogen fall, what uh, form and what they become. They turn into stars. Uh, this is well known. Uh, and one of the popular kinds of machos was just very, very dim stars. And this is one of the things uh, that the Space Telescope helped to rule out uh, because it can see really faint objects and they weren't there. Uh, and so no wimps, uh, no machos. Uh, and. Um, uh, and so we don't know what's going on. That was a digression. Uh, and what I digressed from was the fact that uh, this galaxy that we had measured the mass of turned out to be uh, 2 times 10 to the 11 solar masses, or around 4 times 10 to the 41 kilograms. Uh, if you have these things. Uh, one such galaxy every, I don't know, two megaparsecs or so, what's uh, the density of the universe? Remember, that's where we started of the universe. So now let's finish this calculation. Uh, let's see. Uh, the density is equal to mass over volume, 4 times 10 to the 41. Uh, from observing these orbits. Uh, and uh, the volume down here is going to be 2 megaparsecs cubed. Uh, that's 2 times 10 to the 6 times 2, uh, sorry, times 3 times 10 to the 16. That's 1 uh, parsec. Uh, so this is 6 times 10 to the 22. I want to cube it. 6 cubed. 6 times 6 is. Uh, 36 times another 6 is 200. So that's 200 times 10 to the 66, or 2 times 10 to the 68. So then the density of the universe, 4 times 10 to the 41 over uh, 2 times 10 to the 68. Uh, that's equal to 2 times uh, 10 to the minus 27 kilograms per meter cubed. Uh, and in that, and, and rho critical uh, can be calculated. Turns out to be, uh, as you'll discover on the problem set, six times ten to the minus twenty-seven in these universe, in, in these units. Uh, rho over rho critical is equal to about one third. So if you buy that, the universe uh, is going to keep expanding because o o omega, uh, the ratio of the uh, uh, density to the critical density is only about a third. Uh, but the problem is, we've got all this dark matter around. And what we're doing is we're adding up galaxies. How do you know that there isn't a whole bunch of dark matter where there aren't galaxies and where there's nothing to see orbiting around it? You have no idea what this stuff is. And indeed, most of the WIMP kinds of ideas uh, sort of postulate some kind of dark matter that kind of pervades the universe. And so you'd expect there to be somewhat more of it than you can see in any given galaxy. Uh, well, somewhat more than a third uh, gets you into dangerous territory, uh, namely near one, uh, which is the thing we're trying to distinguish, whether this number is greater than one or not. And so you need a new approach. This isn't going to get you the answer. And so uh, there is a different approach, uh, and that's what we'll talk about 
uh, next time, and that will finally bring us up to frontiers and controversies in the 21st century.